Hi everybody, Curtis Mitch here from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and welcome back to another reflection on today's Mass readings. Now today is a beautiful Monday, April 26th, and instead of looking at the Gospel selection for today, I'd rather kind of focus a little bit of attention on the first reading, because it's really significant. In today's first reading from Acts chapter 11, we have the story of the expansion of the early church. All right, it's a decisive point in time when the, the circle of God's grace begins to widen. All right, his blessings begin to flow out beyond the borders of Israel to even bring salvation to the Gentiles. That's the significant thing. And this is a new development in today's reading. It's centered in particular around an event. There's an event that just took place before today's reading, and that event is the baptism of Cornelius. And this is a momentous step that the church is taking. The baptism of Cornelius is really significant. Why is it significant? Because Cornelius is a Gentile. He's not a Jew. He's not a member of the people of Israel. He's not part of the old covenant community. He's a Roman. He's a centurion. He's an army officer in command of a hundred Roman soldiers, which means he's a Gentile in every sense of the word. And yet he comes to believe in the gospel and receives the Holy Spirit. So this is a defining moment for the church in today's reading. It's where the church takes its first step toward becoming authentically Catholic. Catholic means universal. It's it shows us that the church is intended to be a home for all people of all nations. And today, as you, as you look at this reading, you see that the characters involved, you've got Peter and his companions, you have Cornelius and his household, but really the main actor behind the scenes of everything that is going on is none other than God himself. God is the choreographer of everything that is happening here. He's the one who arranges these events, arranges them to happen how they happen and when they happen. So he's sort of the catalyst. God is pushing the church in this direction to take this new and unprecedented step of accepting and baptizing even Gentiles. And so God actually has to overcome some resistance. And so he's making his message abundantly clear, unmistakably clear, so that the church realizes that this new development is authentically from God himself. So let's look at the reading. It's from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. And we'll try to understand what's going on here. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? But Peter began and explained to them in order, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came down to me. And looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, No, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up into heaven again. At that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were and sent to me from Caesarea. And six brethren also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. Who's the man? The man is Cornelius. All right, he entered Cornelius' house, and he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon called Peter. And he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard this, they were silenced and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance unto life. All right, so what's happening in today's story? You kind of have to go, if you really want to understand this story, you kind of have to go back and read Acts chapter 10 first and then read Acts chapter 11 to really get a sense. And we won't do that in our time together, so I'll try to explain this as clearly as I can. Peter goes up to Jerusalem to tell them about the baptism of Cornelius and his household. And the curious thing is that Peter is immediately criticized, all right? This is a disturbing development for some in the early church, at least those who were called of the circumcision party, all right? These kind of the orthodox, old school Jews who became Christians who looked down on Peter because of his, he actually entered the house of a Gentile and ate with them and baptized with them. Why is that a problem? because Jews did not have social contact with Gentiles, generally speaking. Jews avoided entering Gentile homes. Jews avoided eating at a Gentile table because Gentiles were unclean. Why were Gentiles unclean from a Jewish perspective? Well, the Gentiles ate any foods they wanted. And a Jew has a restricted diet. There are foods that are clean and permissible to eat. And then there are the unkosher foods that are unclean and that Jews and the people of Israel from the time of Leviticus were not allowed to eat. All right. Also, Gentiles did not prepare their food in a way that allowed Jews to eat you know, alongside them and with them because they didn't always drain the blood out of the meat that they served at table. And for a Jew, you could not eat blood. You can't consume blood. That's one of the clearest teachings in the book of Leviticus. There are clean and unclean animals and you cannot consume blood because Gentile tables often had both of those things going on. Jews did not have meals with Gentiles. Beyond that, Gentiles are unclean because they lived grossly immoral lives. They didn't follow the Ten Commandments. They lived however they wanted, all right? And it was a very wanton culture in the ancient Eastern uh, Mediterranean world in lots of ways, especially from a Jewish perspective, but also because Gentiles did not worship the one true God. They worshiped idols. They worshiped a multiplicity of deities, of gods and goddesses. So Jews avoided contact with Gentiles as much as possible. So how does Peter respond to this criticism, right? Peter, as a faith, he, he was a faithful Jew. He grew up Jewish. He knows you're not supposed to go to the house of a Gentile. So how does he respond? What, what is the explanation that Peter gives? Basically, Peter says two things to these criticizers in Jerusalem. He says, God told me and God showed me. I would have no reason to do this, but God told me and God showed me. God told him in the vision. That's a reference back to Acts chapter 10, where Peter had that first vision of the sheet coming down, the different animals, and, and the voice that says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter resists. That's why the vision has to be given to him three times, because there's resistance. He's hesitant. I don't want to do that because the law of Moses tells me there are clean animals and unclean animals. I can't eat, I can't kill and eat unclean animals, right? That would be a violation of the old covenant. But what the vision is showing Peter is that we've moved now from the old covenant into the new, all right? And the restriction on clean and unclean foods is a restriction that is now lifted in the new covenant. There is no long, we're no longer bound to eat certain foods and avoid other foods. All foods have been cleansed. All foods are acceptable as part of the Christian diet, as it were, as distinct from the old Jewish diet. But here's the thing, is that in Acts 10, what Peter comes to discover is that the food laws of the ancient law of Moses, these food laws were not ends and of themselves. They actually pointed to something else. They pointed beyond themselves to, to the fact that the Jews were to be kept separate from the Gentiles, all right? 
in the entire Old Testament economy, the Mosaic economy, prior to the messianic economy of salvation, in Mosaic times, you didn't eat unclean foods, you only ate clean foods, because there's a policy in place for God's covenant people in the Old Testament. And that policy is that Israel is to be kept separate from all other nations, all right? They are the clean ones, the nations are the unclean ones in the Old Testament period because God was investing himself in the one people of Israel, teaching them holiness, teaching them his ways and educating them in the righteousness of the law so that they could grow up to be a witness to the other nations. But now that we've moved from the Mosaic to the Messianic age, now this restriction is lifted and Peter comes to learn that what the food laws symbolized is something that is now entering the phase of fulfillment. All right, so in, in uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 14, Peter says, No, Lord, I can't. He's not going to rise and kill these animals and eat them, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So, so at this level, we're talking about clean and unclean animals, foods that are acceptable and unacceptable. But Peter comes to discover the deeper meaning of what this vision means when he says in verse 28 of Acts 10, he says, God has shown me that I should not call any man, not anything, but any man common or unclean. The cleansing of the animals is a sign that God wants to cleanse all the nations. And so he's pushing the church in this new direction. The dietary restrictions were pointing to something that is now entering this phase of messianic fulfillment. So that's how God told him. He also says God showed him and that he couldn't resist God for this reason as well. God showed him because when Cornelius was listening to the gospel, he and his household, in the midst of Peter speaking, the Holy Spirit descends powerfully upon all who believe, upon Cornelius and his whole household, and they begin to speak in tongues. And what you, what you, what you find out is that if you read through the book of Acts, this is actually a repeat performance of the original Pentecost event, we might say. It's a second Pentecost. At the first Pentecost, the Spirit descends mightily upon Israelites, right? the 12 apostles, all right, and the people in Jerusalem and Judea, and they speak in tongues, and Peter stands up and preaches and issues a call for baptism. In Acts 10, we have the same sequence of events basically repeated, only now it's a Gentile Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends mightily. Peter stands up, he's preaching. They begin to speak in tongues, and then Peter issues a call for baptism again. All right, so it's it's an aftershock of that original Pentecost event, only now it's the Holy Spirit pouring himself out on Gentiles, on the nations. And so Peter says, who was I to withstand God? Clearly God wants us to take this new step, right? God wants to move us in this direction because that's what the Christian gospel is all about. All men and women of all nations are equal candidates for salvation in Christ. All of us belong to the one united family of Adam, which is a fallen family, and God wants to reunite and reconcile to himself every member of the Adamic family, the fallen family of man, to himself and bring them into the family of God. This is the very thing that makes the church Catholic. It makes it universal. The fact that salvation is for everyone. All people of all nations are baptized into the body of the church. All right. And so that's really the message from today's reading. Acts chapter 11 verses 1 to 18 is that the gospel is not just for Israel. The gospel is for everyone. So well, I hope this reflection was of some benefit to you. I pray that God blesses you, your family, and your day. And I look forward to seeing you here again next time. Thanks.